Hello, I'm Andrew Suskind, and I'm a therapist and author based on the west side of Los Angeles since 1992, specializing in trauma and addictions. Welcome to my podcast, named after my recent book, It's Not About the Sex. Here we have honest conversations related to compulsive sexual behavior and trauma, all from a sexual health perspective. Our intention is to offer fresh viewpoints and practical strategies toward establishing greater intimacy and a more deeply connected life. Let's begin. Hi, Sue. Hey, Andrew. How's it going? It's going really well in this crazy, crazy world of ours. I know. It is a crazy world. But I wonder if today's topic may lift you or me or our audience a little bit. I hope so. That would be fantastic. Well, I I chose today's topic, positive psychology and coaching, because I really love positive psychology and coaching. I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's so applicable and and uplifting in in ways that we really need in our mm-hmm. world today, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. More positive people and thinking, I think it raises the energy around other people. Mm-hmm. One thing I wanted to to start with is a story that affects me personally, which was back in 2000, I was feeling a bit burnt out. I was working really, really hard at the time, seeing a lot of clients um, each week. And I just was beyond my capacity. And I was trying to make it work, but I was just tired and not feeling as focused and effective as, as I like to be. Um, I don't know if you remember this or not, Sue, because you, you weren't living on the West Coast at the time, but I actually went to a coaching seminar. Did I ever tell you this story or is this new, new news to you? I know that you did that. Um, well, I know that you went through the coaching certification. Or, yeah. All of yeah. that. It was this prior to that doing that. The, Well, this was part of that. It, it oh, was okay. really, it was really, um, unexpected because I went to the coaching seminar because it was actually walking distance from where I lived at the time here in Santa Monica yeah. to go to a CEU class and to get the six C- CEUs or whatever it was at the time was, was really, um, a gift to just be able to walk over and see what was being presented. So there was a gentleman named uh, Jeff Auerbach, and Jeff Auerbach was the founder of what's called the College of Executive Coaching. And Jeff was a really organized, um, informative, enthusiastic psychologist, but he had shifted from his psychology practice and a more clinical traditional practice into coaching. And in 2000, the year 2000, there weren't that many coaches around. It was still kind of new. So, so we're really turning back the hands of time. And I went up to Jeff at the end of the day. And I said, I said, this was really interesting to me because a lot of things come from psychology, but they're, they're really packaged differently, aren't they? And he said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a different framework. It's a different approach. And it really turned me on so much that I eventually developed this uh, coach training program. So he said, you know, there's this other uh, seminar that's part of my, my training certification that you might want to check out. And believe it or not, he said it was in Costa Mesa, which for those of, of our listeners who don't know the, the distance, Costa Mesa is probably 45 miles from Santa Monica. So there's no way I could walk to right. Costa Mesa. Right, yeah. And somehow I, I got in the car a couple of weeks later and I, and I went to this seminar and there was this trainer, this, this coach trainer who also was a PhD psychologist. Her name was Sam Foster and she was teaching what's called peak performance. And I had no idea what peak performance was at the time, but, but Jeff said, go down and listen to Sam, see what you think. So I have to say, I was so enamored Mm. with the presentation, the grace, the elegance. I think I I, kind of got love addicted to (laughs) to Sam really fast. 
but but I was just really excited because I thought, wow, these PhD psychologists are are teaching coaching, and I had really no idea that this world was out there. And I I went home that day and. I couldn't stop talking about what I learned at the seminar, how it really was so exciting and different and, and had all of this energy behind it that I wasn't feeling in my everyday practice at the time. So needless to say, you, you kind of went to the, to the end, end zone with this. Mm -hmm. I, I did go through an 18 month coach certification and do you know, Sue, like how coaching is related to positive psychology? Do you know how they're kind of uh, cousins in a way? Well, not in an official way. But... No, don't be <laughs> official. Just take a guess. But I would think that um, lay people, you know, without a lot of training um, can become coaches and that they seek out to help people uh, leaving the therapy part behind. So they're just focusing on positive ways to move this person forward in, in creating steps and, and you know guidelines for them to follow type of thing. Absolutely. The way I think about it is that coaching is action-oriented, future-focused, and values-driven. Yeah, that's what I said. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I was just highlighting what you, yeah, thank what you, you. shared. Wow, you say it so much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually think it's, it's something to clarify, right? Because there are so many people nowadays who call themselves coaches. Right. And, and there is no title protection legally. So I was going to say this later, but it's so important to be really careful if you hire a coach to know where their training comes from. Uh, there's a there's an organization called the International Coach Federation, mm -hmm. and that oversees folks who are going through a very specific credentialing process. And so to know that somebody is ICF certified or credentialed is, is helpful. Mm -hmm to know the exact kind of work that they've done and maybe even get some testimonials or, or referrals from someone who you really, really trust. Because unfortunately, it's, it's still the wild, wild west, even, right. even in 2022. Right. So let me backtrack because I, I, I want to talk about positive psychology. Sam and Jeff, they actually wrote a book called P Positive psychology and coaching. So yeah. I'm kind of borrowing the name of their book for today's <laughs> podcast and their passion for it is so strong. And, and I've just learned so much from both of them, especially Sam, because she was my coach okay. um, on and off for several years. But let's go back to 1998. There's a guy named Martin Seligman, Dr. Mm -hmm. Seligman. Are you familiar with him, Sue? Oh yeah. He's the grandfather of positive psychology, right? Yes, exactly. He's the guy who coined the term and what he did, this is an interesting story. He was voted in as the president of the American Psychological Association. And every time someone's voted in to, it's, I forget if it's a one-year term or two-year term, um, they have the choice of coining the theme for, for, the, for the year. And uh. the APA is a gigantic organization. It's international you know, traditionally have been much more about like transference and countertransference and, mm -hmm. and um, more uh, psychoanalytic approaches, sometimes cognitive approaches and different um, approaches that have come up through the years. But if anything, they, they deficits theory was more their leaning. Sure. And here comes Dr. Seligman, who originally in his research, used to study learned helplessness around, I forget what year it was. I want to say the eighties, he ended up flipping his research and starting to look at learned optimism and ended up writing a book called learned optimism. And in 98, which was less than 25 years ago, he came up with the term positive psychology. So we're not talking about something that's been around a long time. It's really the new kid on the block. Mm -hmm. But what he wanted to do, and this is the part that was so inspirational to me, is he wanted to look at what's going right 
with his clients or patients rather than what's wrong. And it, it was a beautiful shift because I, I, I have this idea and I've heard him speak several times. I have this idea that, that he just was getting heavy with his research and wanted to find ways of helping people access their native talents or what he calls signature strength, right? Mm -hmm. So what was so cool about this moment in, in history is that when he talked about this idea of positive psychology, apparently psychologists from around the world literally came out of the woodwork and started to say, wait a second, I've been doing research on gratitude. That's part of positive psychology. I've been doing um, research on forgiveness. That's part of positive psychology. And, and flow, there was a, a gentleman who, who was studying flow, and that's part of positive psychology. So all these folks became like an instantaneous community. And they started having symposiums and conferences. I actually attended one and felt a little inferior because I was really young at the time, but also because most of them were researchers. Okay. There was a clinical component, but positive psychology really has its core in research and academia, which is wonderful and exciting. And I'm going to say something that could be controversial, but it's just how I see it. I think that coaching is kind of like the clinical application of positive psychology. Mm. I hope it gets there. I mean, I still feel like it does need to be regulated a little bit, you know, um, cause there's, there's people out there with good meaning hearts, I think, but not with the right training, but yeah, I like that approach to think of it as it being taking that at those aspects that I, I know you're going to touch upon, um, from positive psychology and applying it into a linear, um, goal set for people. Right. Mm. And, and, and that's the idea that over time it will become more regulated. It will become more cohesive that positive psychology and coaching can really be integrated. Um, I see hope in that, but I also see that it's a slow process because it's, it's, it's something that, that can use more attention. Let's put it that way. But the great thing that's happening is that some of the most famous uh, academic institutions like the University of Pennsylvania, like Harvard, like other schools of that, that caliber are actually developing master's programs in applied positive psychology. Oh, I mean, cool. that to me yeah. is, is astounding. It's so exciting. And, um, and so I, I love that there is an evolution happening. It's just gradual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. They still do teach though, you know, Freud and all those theorists that I get upset every time I take a class and learn about them again. I'm like, okay, we already have heard all of this. I'd ra much rather give my time and energy into looking more into the positive psychology of today and how that applies, you know. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I find it really refreshing. Um, what happened around, I want to say 2002, 2003, on the front of Time Magazine, which was, used to be a really big deal when magazines were, had bigger distribution, um, there was a, a headline, The Science of Happiness. Mm -hmm. and, and it pretty much quoted Dr. Seligman throughout the articles and talked about how this was really a new wave and a, a new chapter for psychology. And, and Dr. Seligman is the first person to say that it's not about taking away anything from traditional psychology or, or what, what we learned all these years. It's about supplementing that so that we can um, leverage people's strength mm -hmm. yeah right finding the strengths and not the deficits as you said that's right yeah why not focus on that that seems so important yeah it's yeah. it's it's catching on more and more and I, I actually think there are people out there and clinicians out there who use positive psychology interventions who don't even realize don't that it's yeah. positive psychology <laughs> yeah i was wondering about that well you're out in like at the conferences more i mean you had been before COVID and, you know, continue to do that now. 
Um, but you, you get a sense that that's what's going on within the, the walls of therapy that people are. Yeah. Like you said, they came out of the woodwork kind of like, I'm already doing this. I'm already, I'm already doing this, you know, and it just, <laughs> it kind of actually fits together because, um, as people evolve and become more aware, I think they, uh, psychologists and therapists are always a work in progress, right? So unless you're right. helping yourself, it's hard to help right. somebody else. And, and just to give an example, if, if I'm seeing someone for uh, several years, let's say we've been working on trauma healing, we've been working on um, relationships, we've been working on family of origin issues, all of those things are, of course, primary, right? That, that, that often is what weighs people down, the themes and patterns of the past. But I don't want to dwell for five years, 10 years beyond that. I, I really want to help people move forward with what, what talents lie within them and to really look at their resourcefulness. It's interesting. Um, mm. This reminds me of, about my somatic experiencing training because in SE, somatic experiencing, we look at things like resilience and resourcefulness and regulation. And even though we're talking about the nervous system and helping people heal from trauma, we're also talking about helping individuals really um, get to know those parts of themselves that that help them uh, create something positive and something hopeful and something more fulfilling in their future so even though you know it's 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 challenging because legally and ethically we cannot as clinicians do therapy and do coaching simultaneously we're not supposed to we can borrow ideas from positive psychology and from coaching and, and infuse them into the work, but we can't do both. We have to, I, I believe this is my, okay. my, my understanding what mm -hmm. actually Jeff Auerbach taught, taught me at the very beginning that it has to be very cleanly separate. So um, a coach, for instance, really is not supposed to be going back into someone's past and, and dredging their in, into their history. Right right? But a therapist has a little more leeway to help somebody look at specific therapeutic goals and moving forward and finding things that are really going to be more, um, you know, more, more liberating for, for them over time. Yeah, I think um, therapists and coaches should be able to work together and, you know, the kind of team approach to help somebody, it would be a really good, uh, facility to set up, I think, you know, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I couldn't agree more on our podcast. As you know, we've had two coaches, I believe we had uh, Daisy Swan, who's a career coach. And we had Patty Britton, who's a sex coach. And I've worked collaboratively with them for years. Mm -hmm. And I love it because it cleanly gives them the coaching experience and and the therapeutic experience stays in my office mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. i think that's an important point that, that you're making sue yeah i mean i went through some coaching um accreditation um for a happiness coaching which was really fun i got a lot out of it but it, there was a lot of questioning about therapy in there and how what do you do and you refer out you know that's a big part of it I don't want anybody coming to see me unless they're seeing a therapist or have seen a therapist and understand what the boundaries are because um, that's not my role. That's so. a really, really important point. And I know when I used to do more coaching, I was educating my clients and my colleagues all the time. Now there's different approaches and different frames that, that, clinicians and coaches use. So I'm just talking from my experience, but I, I just, you know, I think there's so much abundance out there and I really want to uh, find the best support for, for my clients, like a sex coach or like a career coach who both Daisy Swan and, and Patty Britton 
are, are, are two of the best coaches in, well, anywhere really, but certainly in Southern California. For sure. That's yeah. great to have them nearby, but I'm sure they reach out to anyone you refer to. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you have a list here that I thought would be kind of cool to go over. Um, spiritual and existential process, I guess is what you titled it. Can we talk a little bit about these? Absolutely. Yeah. So the reason I, I, I highlighted spiritual and existential is because it, it actually refers to coaching and at least the version of therapy that I do and 12 step. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm wearing my 12 step hat or I'm wearing my positive psychology coaching hat, or I'm wearing my therapy hat, I always carry this idea of spiritual existential questioning. So in other words, one of the questions I always ask is what matters most to you? So off the top of your head, Sue, what, what matters most to you? Um, I'd say my children first. Yeah. Yeah. And what else? And their happiness and yeah, just happiness. Okay. Health. And, be, and beyond the kids, what health? Yeah. I think health is important. It's at the top there. Yeah. That matters. So, so we could go through that question over and over and over, kind of like squeezing a, 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 a lemon and to see what matters most to you. And, and that's a very spiritual existential question. It's, it's actually a, a, a values clarification, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So in coaching, um, we're looking at things that are values driven. So we want to identify what are my values, right? What are my values? You know, I just got back from a trip. So travel is actually a value of mine that is near the top. Mm -hmm because I learn about myself, I have fun, I play, I eat good food, I get rest, I get our, um, rejuvenated, mm -hmm. all of that. So, so the spiritual existential aspects is, is like the umbrella of all of these. So we're talking about commonalities between, um, really between 12 step and between positive psychology. So for instance, historically in the 12 steps, there's an expression um, in step six and seven about character defects. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an old traditional way of looking at things, right? Taking an inventory of one's character defects. In positive psychology, as we talked about, it's actually taking an inventory of one's signature strengths. I know Daisy uses an actual way of kind of deciphering what one's six signature strengths are right mm -hmm. so she yeah. understands okay so this is what is really easy and and um something that is natural for someone and and these things are not so easy and natural right so signature strength is is one thing that dr seligman talks about another thing is forgiveness right mm -hmm. so forgiveness yeah. can be looked at in so many different ways but i'm going to talk about it from a, a secular perspective you know in the eighth and ninth steps of the 12 mm -hmm. steps there's a talk about making amends right now forgiveness um is really can be a very gentle and uh comprehensive way of taking ownership and really looking at what one's contribution was to something that maybe went awry, mm -hmm. right? right? But um, from positive psychologists, they would talk about forgiveness very much as a learning opportunity and, and very much as how can you have a process that's respectful to yourself and the other person? Very similar, actually, to the 12 steps in a Absolutely. way. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And then there's many, many researchers nowadays and many, many books on gratitude. Yeah. Have you, are you familiar with any, anyone or any books that, that you know of, Sue? Um, well, not in particular, but different exercises that I would do. Like we had a gratitude jar um, where what I would just keep strips of paper and a pencil next to it and just have the kids at the end of the day write a gratitude, you know, something to be thankful about and put it in the jar and then we would read it when it filled up. So, but 
it means a lot when you're having a bad day and you forget there's so many things to be grateful for. So I, I always thought it was a booster. It was like, yeah, helped you feel better. And that's exactly what the research is showing. We're talking about research-based boosters, as you call it. Some people in their research call it counting your blessings. Some people talk about it as, as gratitude, but there's so many different interventions. And what you described with the gratitude jar is a positive psychology intervention. We're not talking about rocket science, right? Yeah. We're talking about taking stock of what, in this case, what's in our heart, what's meaningful and what, what really, um, a reason to wake up in the morning is how, uh, Dr. Seligman sometimes talks about it. It make, you know, making things a little easier will make your lives feel a little better. You know, mm -hmm. even just small steps that you can take. Cause I feel like right. we're all just inundated with so much information and it's just nonstop mm -hmm. sometimes. So it's nice just to be able to take a moment for some gratitude. Right. One thing that I wanted to give as an example, and this is kind of like gratitude, but it's actually an action step uh, around it is uh, Sam used to say this to me, what, what's one small thing that would make the biggest difference? What's one small thing mm. today that you could do for yourself or for someone else that would make the biggest difference? Sometimes just thinking or pausing before you say something, you know, I could, I could think of a couple conversations I had today that um, maybe if I just walked away, it would have made a bigger difference for me okay. personally, because I was trying to help somebody out, but wasn't getting there. And it was frustrating. So I was feeling myself really change inside with my frustration and was verbalizing my frustration. Um, but I think if I just turned away, I, I would have served myself a little better. Okay. So what, what you're sharing is, is an awareness that it wasn't the choice that you want to repeat over and over again, that next time maybe you'll bite your tongue or maybe you'll walk away and get a drink of water or, or just walk away and not come back or whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, I, I think that's what we're talking about is, is that, that actually feels like a self-compassion uh, moment that as you were talking. Right. Right. It would have served me better. Cause I felt like, ugh, yeah. After. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, why did I let it go that far? Yeah. You know, even though I was aware how it was making me feel, but yeah. the second time it happened today, I actually said, Oh, I have to go. And yeah. then <laughs> I just said, left because I'm like, I'm not doing this again for the second time. Cause I felt so gross and it took a while to really bounce back from it, but it was like having a nice glass of water and just doing some self care, but being a, yeah, like you said, awareness is key. And, and the more practice it's like practice, I guess, as it arrives in front of you, having the opportunity right. to, I think you had a quote up maybe this week about this. You don't die from stress. You die from your reaction to stress. And exactly. it's kind of all about this. Right. That, yeah. And I think that I'm glad you mentioned that quote because it, it comes from a very famous stress researcher. But what we're talking about is in that example is when we feel stress, what action can we take that would really make a difference, right? How can we rehearse that? How can we, you know, have maybe a menu of options mm -hmm. of things that we can do differently? Um, but knowing that we're, we're not victims and that we have choices basically. Yeah. 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 And I think it, it would have helped me. It's going to help me tomorrow and the next day and the next day, if I remember this. So maybe even jotting it down would be right. and reminding myself until it's in there, because don't we repeat a lot of these patterns that we've done for many years Yeah. without really thinking sometimes, because it's almost like a triggering effect, but yeah, I mean, learning what you actually can learn in the moment is so important, but I like yeah. having like the action step, like maybe a reminder of like, hey, you can make a choice. You don't have to go there. You know, you don't need that mm -hmm. in your body. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. So along those lines, there's a few other, there's so many different positive psychology interventions, but some of the most common ones are what's called savoring, which is for me, I'll give <laughs> my example. Um, I, I, my, the pool going swimming mm -hmm. is my happy place nowadays. And even as I talk about it, I, I can immediately visualize being in the water and having that 45 minutes to myself. And, and so savoring it, mm. and, and like you said, you could write about it, you could share it with a friend like I'm doing right now with you, Sue, mm -hmm. I could um, close my eyes and, and think about that pool that I go into two to three times a week. Mm -hmm. But savoring is we forget is a way of, of really building neural pathways, mm. right? Yeah. It's just, is it the um, time alone and doing something for yourself? Is it the whole package that you really enjoy? Or is it just the actual swimming or? Well, for me, it's being away from my phone. Mm, it's um, yeah. being in the water, which I've always enjoyed since I was a kid. It's about doing something good for my body and coming out after my swim and feeling like I've done really something really good for myself. Mm. So, I mean, we were talking with Dr. DeMello recently about mind, body, spirit, and, um, and that's, it just captures all of that for me. Right. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Savoring it is, you kind of want to put it in a bottle, right? So you can take it out, but yeah, just lock it in there. So you can mm -hmm. access it. That's for cool. Sure. I don't think enough people do that savoring. We forget, yeah. we, we go from one thing to the other and, and don't pay attention to, to how things really can be more ingrained, more something that, that's not just a habit or a routine, but something that we can say, wow, I'm so grateful I have the pool to go swimming in, or wow, my, my body feels better as a result of, yeah. of spending the time in the pool, yeah. The other things that go along with that are kindness and self-kindness. So that's in the area of self-compassion, of course, and, and empathy, right? So coaches can work, as I'm sure you know, one-on-one -on -one with people sort of in a, in a private practice or possibly in a, in a rehab, or um, sometimes executive coaches will work with corporate um, folks who can use the support around empathy and kindness and teamwork and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of different training that goes into being a, a really great coach. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think like with anything, it's, it's got to be something that you feel so passionate about and really interested in, in pursuing. I know we touched upon this a little bit. Is there anything else you want to say about how coaching is different from therapy? Well, I'm glad you asked. I will, I could talk for quite a while about this, but I'll go back to where we started. So coaching is future focused, action oriented, and values driven. It has a different energy. I, I know when I did more coaching back in the day, I, I, I had a different energy when I was doing coaching. Therapy is, is a healing process, right? It's often about the healing of the past where coaching is about the future, right? And I'm talking more in terms of, of psychodynamic therapy, but also even somatic therapies. I think that it's, it's much more about healing. Traditionally, therapy is more about deficits and pathology, but nowadays there's becoming much more focus, like in the somatic community, on resources and resilience and helping people feel more regulated more of the times, but that's more nervous system oriented, right? Coaching is traditionally, and there's different coaches out there, but traditionally it's about moving from point A to point B and, um, and helping people when they trip up, right? If, if someone has blocks, can we work on the blocks from a coaching perspective? Do they need some therapy to work on the blocks? That's again, one of those gray areas. And I think someday there'll be more fluidity around um, being able to do a little of both. But what I wanna say about, um, about coaching is that generally, generally speaking, it's shorter term. You know, I see 
clients in my therapy practice for years, generally speaking, some shorter, some longer, but, but my coaching clients, I would see for maybe three months, six months, nine months, but not much beyond that. Coaching also is all about homework and all about assignments and all about as much contact between sessions as someone needs, right? So that's different. Uh, I, I know some therapists are homework therapists. It's just not my style. Mm -hmm. And, and so that that's a difference. And also, I think the whole idea of positive psychology was about is strength based, right? And again, nowadays, there's more emphasis in the therapy world on, on looking at strengths. But coaching really is the core is about a strength based wellness model. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it sounds fantastic. I mean, if you're ready and open to do the work, going with a coach seems like, you know, a really like you're ready to take action. It's, it's a lot of work, you know, you just gotta be open to it. And, you know, seeing a therapist also is, could be a lot of work, but it doesn't have to be. Right. And, and that's a really good point that it's all about readiness. When somebody is considering coaching and I refer people to coaches all the time, um, I really want to assess whether they have the time and focus and, and energy to apply themselves to the coaching process, because I want them to really enjoy it, right? It's supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. I, I know that when I worked with my coach, Sam, back in 2000, 2001, it was, it sounds a little um, hyperbolic, but it was life changing. Mm -hmm. You know, she was an amazing coach. And she helped me believe in myself in ways that I, I didn't even imagine. And so there was an expansion and an opportunity to really grow in my practice and in my life in ways that I hadn't anticipated. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. With that said, I have so much gratitude for, for Sam Foster. And really all the, the coaches and, and Dr. Seligman and, and positive psychologists who have laid the groundwork for where we are today and continue to go. Yeah, it's, it's great talking about this and just to be reminded and also to remind the listeners that there is positive psychology out there. And um, if you can't find it, you should look for it. You know, I mean, it's, it's definitely helpful in, in helping you get over some hurdles and blocks, like you said. So it's wonderful to talk about this today. Thanks, Sue. It's always a joy to spend the time. And I'm grateful for our relationship and, and our conversation today, as always. Yeah, I'm going to savor this. Me too. Thanks for listening today. It was so terrific sharing the time with my colleague and friend, Sue Merlino and discussing this really meaningful topic. If you're so inclined, please give us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe and share my podcast with those who may benefit. I look forward to you joining us the next time. And don't forget to stay connected. <laughs>